really can't believe it's been 16 years. I think I say that every single year. I can't believe it's been X number of years. Uh, we were both in college on 9-11. Uh, I, I remember very distinctly my my mother calling to wake me up, and I was just pissed off that she woke me up because I had late classes that day. And she just said, turn on the TV, and I looked, and, and you know, I couldn't believe what you were seeing. And even I, I woke up and saw the uh, towers after they had been hit, but even after they were hit, I said, oh, that's horrible, but, you know, they'll rebuild. It never crossed my mind they would come down. And then, of course, when that happened, you know, you just you know, words left you. And still, 16 years later, you'll never forget that feeling of, of what we saw that morning. Absolutely not. You know, each generation seems to have their moment in time and history that's seared into their memory. Of course, you know, for our parents' generation, it was the Kennedy assassination. For our grandparents, it was Pearl Harbor. For us, those of us that were of age by the time September 11, 2001 happened, it is a date that will live in infamy, that we will never forget. We will remember exactly where we were, how we felt, what it looked like. Um, to see that happen and the uncertainty of what would lie ahead in the days that followed of, of where we were going to war and, and what was going to happen to us. And, you know, there was just so much uh, that was not known. And it was a pretty scary time to live through as any of us who were around for it remember. And for me, as a high school history teacher, you know, as we get on in years now, 16 years out from it, my students were actually born after it took place. And, you know, they are the 9-11 generation because they've known no other world than the one that we've lived in post 9-11. And so it's very interesting to me that, that these kids look at it more, more as a history lesson than as something that they lived. It's really how I decide whether you're an adult or still a kid, and that's just me being an old person saying kid. Um, I, if, whether you remember what it was like or what was going on on 9-11, uh, I worked with somebody who was like 23 or 24, uh, but you know, they really they were alive during 9-11, but they really have no real memory of what it was like. And I'm like, man, not only am I feeling my age, like you said, it's so strange that there are people growing up right now who, who I mean, I look at like Pearl Harbor and I'm like, oh, that's sad, but... And not really. I mean, it's just an event that happened in the past. I don't you know, really have any emotional connection. And we're growing up with people now that feel the same way. So it's just really strange as time goes on um, how how tragedies just become, you know, an, another history story, a you know, history lesson we we read. And, and hopefully, though, these, these ones actually stand out and, uh, and stay in people's minds because, you know, God forbid, anything ever happens again. But, you know, it's always a possibility. Well, and this one certainly has shaped us and it's it shaped the world that we live in and, and how we've come to experience this country and the world at large. So, you know, the best we can do is hope to learn from those events and, and try to prevent them from happening in the future. Indeed. Now, we want to give a shout out to all of our listeners in Florida. I know Irma hit over the weekend. This wasn't quite as bad as it could have been, um, but there's, I've seen pictures. A lot of this stuff, just it looks horrible. Uh, I know one of our fellow Ace Podcast Network shows, uh, Just Dudes Being Guys, were right in the, in the middle of everything. I think they were recording an episode during the storm, and they posted recently that you know, everything, at least the, I guess one of their college dorms is okay. It's where they're, where they're living, but I guess one of the houses they're in is or the, the town is just covered in, in water. So it's everybody down there. We're wishing you uh, the best and a speedy recovery. Absolutely. And to those of you out there in Houston, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit partial. Uh, we're still thinking of you too. So, you know, hopefully things get better real soon for all of those impacted by Mother Nature's wrath. Now that we have that all out of the way, I want to go to some happy news, Kevin. Uh, I didn't put this on the rundown, but I, I read this this evening, and oh, both these things are just wonderful. One, Melissa McCarthy won an Academy or won an Emmy for her impression of Sean Spicer on Saturday Night Live. They held the, I guess, the Creative Arts Emmys uh, earlier this week, so that's great. And two, this Wednesday, on Jimmy Kimmel, Sean Spicer will be making his first media appearance and i want to make damn sure to watch that well speaking of spicy i happened to see this week uh, that he's signed up for a speaking tour he signed down with an agency to represent him uh in a public speaking tour so it didn't take him long as we figured uh, to be able to go share his insights around the country of what exactly it was like to work for donald trump in the white house and 
know, it should be interesting to hear. Maybe he'll come around here sometime, Jess, so we can go hear him speak. If he's in Connecticut or Southern Mass, we are going there. Um, I don't care what the crowd is, whether it's left, right, or in between. Um, it's like, spicy, I love you. You know, have a little sign with a spicy with a heart through it. You know, for all his faults, I really miss the guy. I miss, I miss those daily briefings. You know, they say you don't know what you have till it's gone sometimes. So, all right, on to some real news from the last week or so. On the last show, we talked about uh, how Trump was going to be ending the Obama era program for action for childhood arrivals, a.k.a. DACA. Sure enough, last Thursday or last Tuesday, excuse me, uh, Trump had our old friend Jeff Sessions, Jeff Beauregard Sessions, uh, give the press conference about ending the program because, you know, why do that yourself when you can have one of your stooges go out there and do it for you? Yes, absolutely. No cojones to do it yourself, big man. Um, just reminding people who may be listening, uh, you know, this program is going to be hurting more than 800,000. I forget the actual number, more than 800,000 people who were brought here legally as children, but you know, they grew up here uh, for all intents and purposes. They're American. They don't know where else. You can send them back to their quote unquote home countries, but they have you know no memory of what it was like in Mexico or whatever other country um, it may have been. A White House spokesman said the administration acted lawfully to correct the unconstitutional actions taken by former President Barack Obama, and now it is up to Congress to act on behalf of the American people. Okay, pause, time out. Can we at least be honest with ourselves here <laughs> and bring up the fact that the reason why President Obama uh, acted, quote unquote, unconstitutionally so many times was because of the failures of Congress to ever act. So had Congress done more of its job and taken its responsibilities representing the people more seriously and stopped the infighting and stopped the partisan bickering, perhaps the president wouldn't have felt the need to try to force some action by executive order. And it's interesting how sometimes the White House is – they're down with the executive order even if they probably shouldn't be making that executive order uh, and when, it, when it's something that they want to push through. Uh, it's it's weird because after this has all gone down, um, Trump has been acting you know, weirdly in the last week or so. We'll get to that in a little bit, but I think he's finally realized people may be hating him. Uh, on September 7th, Trump tweeted out, for all those DACA that are concerned about your status during the six-month period, you have nothing to worry about. No action. He's referring, of course, to the six-month grace period and points out the administration is not immediately uh, rescinding any of these protections from people. Um, Trump, uh, Trump, ooh, Freudian slip oh, there, sorry. Slip, uh, <laughs> Trump uh, chose to reassure people, something that we don't normally see out of him. Uh, I read today that Nancy Pelosi actually uh, was the one that pushed him to do that after he called her. Um, I, I doubt this makes anybody feel any better, but I guess it's something. Well, what concerns me a little bit is that the president expects Congress to actually take action on this. You know, hopefully they do. Uh, and without it, it, it could be detrimental to the Republicans in the 2018 midterm elections. So I think that might actually have to force their hand. But typically, Congress has not been too quick to act on these things. Yeah, we'll talk about Steve Bannon in just a few minutes, but uh, one of the things he said last night in 60 Minutes was that he definitely thinks the GOP is going to be hurt in the 2018 elections by the whole DACA debacle. Um, I, I think that something is going to get done, whether it's Trump just going back and making another executive order or whether Congress gets together and puts something together because uh, if you look at it, both sides of the aisle, the vast majority of people are really just – mortified this whole thing happened i think they're gonna get something passed i don't know uh when it'll be in the next six months uh and i guess i shouldn't be in the prediction business because you know the last prediction i made in november didn't work out so well but um i'm feeling good that something's gonna be happening well, well it would so. certainly behoove them you know politically and you know, for all we know, they might be looking for many of the members of Congress might be looking for, yeah, you know, new wait staff at home or, or <laughs> new lawn uh, landscapers at home if they don't do that. Right. We, we know that the, the way to solve the problem of immigration is not so much through ordering people deported, but for looking at the economic reasons why people come to this country. And if the jobs are available and conditions for living are not suitable in home countries, that. It's going to drive people into this country. Yeah. And, and people may be saying, oh, Kevin, you know, you're saying all these people are, are waiters. But, you know, those are 
honest jobs, honest living. And yes, a lot of the folks who come to this country do those honest jobs because people like you and me don't want to do them. Uh, we also see a lot of these dreamers are just geniuses. They're very smart. They're very positive. They're going to college. They're getting great jobs out there and, and they're helping stimulate our economy. They're not taking anything away from anybody. Well, the president has in his own track record of hiring yeah. illegal immigrants to work on construction projects for his properties. All right. This goes back and it doesn't just come from uh, Central America. He hired European immigrants, Polish immigrants, people who were coming here from all over the world to work in, for his businesses uh, at bare bottom wages. So this is something that the president and his party probably uh, has been dealing with for a long time in their own personal histories. And for them to now uh, leave the, the children of immigrants who were brought here through no fault of their own hanging out to dry like this is, you know, unconscionable. Yeah, that's that's the word. So, uh, you know, we're, again, we'll have to just wait and see. It's like so many things going on today. We have to wait and see because, uh, unfortunately, a snap of the fingers doesn't answer all of our prayers as much as we wish it was otherwise. Um, but, you know, Kevin, remember how I said that Trump was acting a little untrump like in this last week? Uh, last week, Trump uh, broke with the GOP, actually, uh, on the debt ceiling deal and went along with the Pelosi-Schumer plan. Now, if you guys don't know what the debt ceiling is, it was set up in the early 1900s so the Treasury Department could borrow money uh, up to a limit without repeatedly having to go to Congress over and over again for permission. Uh, these days, conservatives see it as a way to control federal spending. Uh, it's, it's quite an ordeal to go through this fight over the debt. It happens time and time again. Um, votes to raise the debt ceiling, which allows the U.S. to continue to borrow money so that it doesn't have to default on its debt, are usually pretty political in nature. We see Republicans and Democrats just bashing heads. And I'm, I'm sorry. I thought we were going to see it again this time. We may see it again in a few months. Um, but not raising the debt ceiling would basically be a financial disaster, uh, would be cause the global market, uh, market to panic. Um, so we end up playing this game of chicken uh, with, you know, the only thing at stake is the world's economy. Well, and it's a very dangerous game to be played. And we saw it under the Obama administration. It was raised five times. And each of those five times, it was the same political argument back and forth in Congress with threats of shutting down the government mm. and so on, et cetera. Uh, and it's a dangerous game to be playing with the world's economy at stake, as you said. So this go around raising the debt was tied to Hurricane Harvey. Really. If we talked about that last episode, I know uh, we weren't sure whether it was going to happen. It didn't happen in the House. It happened between the House and the Senate. Um, and the relief has to be passed. I mean, it, it had to get done um, or people in, in Houston would be in big trouble. Uh, and the Dems didn't really have much leverage, but I guess it didn't matter. They really just bluffed their way to victory. Um, Ryan and McConnell... Uh, the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader uh, wanted to raise it to like after 18 months, like after the midterm elections. Don't have to worry about it for a while. It will become an issue. Uh, but there was no way Pelosi and Schumer are uh, going to let that happen. So the Dems came back with three months. And this guy, our president, who, you know, quote, unquote, is the author of The Art of the Deal, uh, rather than really negotiating, we just like, sure, OK, that sounds great. I'll endorse it, uh, which you know, didn't make the GOP very happy. Well, quite the surprise, quite the shock, and perhaps it is due to the fact that maybe he's starting to read some of those poll numbers and realize that his decisions have not been too po uh, have not been too popular with the American public. I would like to think that, but then I think we're giving him too much credit. Maybe he was just like, "Sure, sounds good, let's do it." Yeah, perhaps it could be. Sometimes I think he flies by the seat of his pants and throws paint at the wall to see uh, how it sticks. <laughs> and you know, soon after this all happened, uh, Ivanka popped into the Oval Office and through the whole meeting, because we all know Trump can really only focus on one thing at a time. And of course, when Ivanka is there, his lovely Ov Ivanka who calls him daddy, not creepy at all. Um, you know, threw the whole the whole meeting into a tizzy. You know, it was basically just done at that point. Again, that really pissed off the GOP. They were not happy with Ivanka. I think Ivanka and Don, or Donald, Mr. President, Donald Trump, uh, don't realize that uh, she's not as impressive as people think. I mean, she's a lovely young lady, um, but other than that, I don't think I would care if I was Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell. No. What business does she have being in the White House anyway? What are her credentials? We, we're more qualified to be in the White House than she is, honestly. That, that's honestly uh, the truth. Um, McConnell, Ryan, 
uh, Steve Mnuchin, they all they all advocated for a longer debt limit. Uh, Ryan actually said the short-term de- uh, debt limit uh, was ridiculous, disgraceful, playing politics. Again, as you mentioned, this happened during the Obama administration. They had no problem playing politics back then. Now there's a GOP in the White House. Oh, that it's horrible. It's, we see this but with both sides uh, on numerous issues that it's, it's disgusting when they do it, uh, when the other side does it, but when they do it later on, it's, it's just fine. Exactly, and, and I feel that it should be brought up again and be reminded uh, to the Republicans in control of Congress that when you were playing obstructionist for the previous eight years, it was okay. And now when the shoe's on the other foot, it's a lot harder to govern. And you see exactly what it is like to be obstructed every step of the way. You know, they say what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Uh, I guess. <laughs> uh, so the House and Senate passed this bill that bet ceiling is okay for another three months. Uh, and apparently Trump loved, you know, Trump loves when people say great things about him. He loves the positive press is getting him. He called up Schumer. Uh, and Schumer told us to the New York Times. He called up Schumer and said, Fox is praising you and your stations are praising me. This is great. And you know what? If, if bipartisanship and getting things done in a bipartisan manner make him happy going forward, well, then – do it, Trump. I'll start. I was going to say I was going to start supporting him. I can't say that, but I'll. Um, I won't crap on him as much if he starts doing things with both sides. It is perhaps one of the wisest things he has said in his time as president. Out of the mouths of babes, kind of. You know, it's a. Uh, he didn't mean to say it. It just kind of came out. But I'll. I'll take it anyways. I'll take a win any way I can get it. Huh. So we, we mentioned a little earlier today that Steve Bannon was on 60 Minutes last night. I actually missed it when it was on. I had to go back and watch it because I'm like, how can I pass up a chance to see Steve Bannon? And interestingly enough, who knows who to believe? Uh, some of the right-wing websites are saying that CBS adjusted the tint of the uh, interview to make him look a little redder, you know, his eyes more bloodshot to make him look worse, where if you did it quote-unquote normally, he would look – Normal. I, I looked at it. I mean, whenever I see a picture of of him, he always looks bloodshot, like he's ready to be on death's door. I think the uh, GOP were adjusting it the other way to make him look better. Right. You know, it's it's no secret. It's it's been out there in the media, in the news, that uh, the man has had some issues with substances. Uh, he's worked in a very high profile, high stress job for the last six months. Um, he, he's not going to look. You know, like he's ready for a photo shoot. And he's certainly never been one, even when he was in the White House, to make himself look like he was ready for any type of publicity. So, you know, why should we expect any different now that he's out of the White House and he's back at home working for Breitbart? So I swear, if you look at pictures of him from like college and high school, dude was a handsome dude back then, I think. I looked at him like, oh my God. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to praise Bannon because he's a lunatic. But, I mean, maybe it's just based on what he looks like now compared to what he was then. I'm like, you know, and he could have passed as a as – a kind of, but then again, like, you know, Nixon. Some people think Nixon was a handsome guy back when he was playing football and, in college, and, you know, look what he became. So, you know, I guess you never know. I don't know. So uh, Bannon basically admitted that the media image of him is pretty accurate. Uh, he gets along with Trump, at least this is what he says, because they're both street fighters. And really just admitted that Breitbart's purpose is to support Donald Trump. And that's – that right there is, is showing they're going to go through – he won't, he won't say it's fake news, but it's definitely slanted news if your job is to defend one person and not to report the truth. And since the readers of Breitbart are already supporters of Donald Trump, it falls on deaf ears. <laughs> yeah, you're preaching to the choir basically. So finally in Charlottesville, we all know that Trump should have immediately denounced Nazis, white supremacists, all of the bad folks who were down there with their tiki torches and their little polos. But Bannon kept on defending the people. You know, they, most of them were good people. They were uh, supporting the monuments. And he went basically to the talking points of, you know, what are we going to do next? Take down Mount Rushmore? Somebody on Fox News today said, you know, what are they going to do one day? Want to take down the 9-11 memorial? Come on. There's a big difference between... The president's, and especially a memorial to 9 11, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. And Confederate judges who were part of a group that was trying to pull away from America, basically who were traitors. Right. It's, I, people are really drawing at straws here to, to try to make those arguments. I mean, it, we've, we've gone over this time and again, and you cannot justify the actions of the people from the alt right, these neo Nazis. 
that were marching on Charlottesville. There, there is no justifying that. There was not a good person in the bunch. You cannot be a good person and have such ill will towards fellow Americans to want to see groups of people eradicated or groups of people being, you know, through terrorism, it is, it is terrorism, uh, to have them scared away from participating in their society. Well, you said this before, and I'll say it again. There is no group in the history of the world that should be easier for an American to denounce than Nazis. I mean, from, from Casablanca to Indiana Jones, they've been the villains on every media platform you can think of uh, for the past 65, 70 years. And yet Trump, he just, just couldn't do it. Um, but then again, the way that, that, uh, that Bannon is looking at things is that you're either with the president – or you resign. You, you never break with him on anything as long as you work for him. And I actually think that's a really bad uh, attitude to take because you want – I mean there's the, the, the classic line, you know, if you're smart uh, or if you're stupid, surround yourself with smart people. If you're smart, surround yourself with smart people who disagree with you. You don't want yes men and sycophants around you because uh, you're not going to learn anything. There's nothing going to be – nothing's going to be changed out of what you're saying. The cabinet that surrounded President Abraham Lincoln in the early 1860s was famously known as a team of rivals. And Lincoln purposely did this so that the discourse that took place within the cabinet meetings would provide answers and some solutions to some of the problems that were facing them. If you're only hearing what you want to hear, you're never going to get the best options, the best ideas for handling the issues that face you in your time. And let's not forget the video from a few months ago where all the cabinet members took their turn to basically get on their knees and thank President Trump for uh, letting them work for him and how oh, great he's the most wonderful. disgusting thing I've uh, seen. That, that really – out of anything I've seen in politics, that was probably – just made me feel really gross inside. But Bannon did criticize Trump a little bit. He said that firing Comey was probably the – well, one person said – he said that it was the biggest mistake in political history. Bannon came back and said, you know, it's a little too bombastic even for him. Uh, maybe the biggest mistake in modern political history, which, you know, we're splitting hairs there. Um, Bannon said, that, you know, if Comey had not been fired, Trump wouldn't be facing a special cross, a prosecutor investigating uh, the Russia interference of 2016 election. Um Trump really kind of rolled the snowball down the hill himself, and now that there's a gigantic boulder coming straight at uh, the White House or Mar-a-Lago, whatever you want to say, um, he has no one to blame but himself. Is Mar-a-Lago underwater? Did we find that out? No. <laughs> so, I heard they were forced to evacuate, but I had not heard it, how it fared. Well, the newest uh, back and forth today was uh, our good friend Michael Moore, who – I'm no fan of personally, but that's that's a story for another day. Uh, Michael Moore tweeted out, "Oh, we're we using Mar-a-Lago for a uh, for a shelter yet." And then Don Jr. pointed out that it's on an or it's like on an island or it's on the coast, and and it would be stupid to do that. But you know, he's just pushing his narrative, and I, I think. Uh, People like Trump and Mar-a-Lago, they somehow – they're cockroaches. They always seem to survive. You know. Hey, look. I say turn it into a Hooverville. You know, Put a tent city out there. <laughs> you know, have people you know, uh, uh, protesting every night outside of Mar-a-Lago as they live in their tents trying to get their basic needs met. Uh, Tom by, Joad know, out there. Organizations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, This is uh, something uh, that should be done. But of course, uh, Bannon's not just happy just attacking – the left, of course, he has to attack the right as well, the GOP establishment. He swears they're trying to nullify the 2016 election, especially Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. Uh, they don't want Trump's populist economic agenda to be implemented. Um, he thinks the GOP leadership uh, should have passed health care reform, should have passed tax reform. Uh, they dropped the ball. Uh, it's you know, nothing they did. Is, it's not their fault. It's all the GOP establishment for not doing what they said they were going to do. Uh, and he thinks he needs to attack these people, even though they support Trump, because they need to be put on notice. Well, that's not how I run things, but okay. Well, and it's a failure to take responsibility for anything. And we've seen that time and again. And I, we've how many times have we said we shouldn't be surprised? And I don't think we really are surprised, but I feel it you know, it should be addressed. Once again, we should not let people forget that this is an administration that refuses to take any kind of responsibility for any of its failures, always looking to pass the buck to somebody else. So one of the things that uh, Bannon said, I was going to hit a map, then I actually thought about it. You know what? It sounds kind of similar to what President Obama said. I remember uh, I was not a fan of President Obama's uh, 
change. I, I, thought, I thought it was, you know, be a political BS. Change, change, change. And I remember at one point, he was after he was elected, he goes, you know, change isn't going to happen in, you know, in one year or eight years. Change is going to take a while to work at. And similarly, Bannon is saying, you know, uh, draining the swamp isn't going to happen in one or two years or eight years. It's going to take forever. Uh, so I, I think they're setting the ground uh, work right now for Trump to say, sure, we haven't drained the swamp yet, but it's going to take time. So reelect me. You can't blame me for what I promised to do, but I haven't done yet. Right. And those of us in the voting public need to be wise enough to understand that one person, one politician, one elected official cannot bring the type of change that we really need no. by themselves in a short period of time. It's a, a systemic issue that needs to be dealt with over the course of years as we elect people who actually go to Washington to represent the best interests of the people. And the people who are considered the swamp, they can actually help uh, change things. And I know it's probably against it, but it's who they hire to work for them or uh, who politicians want. You know, lobbyists are part of part of life in D.C. I was a lobbyist. There's nothing wrong with that. It's the kind of lobbyist you hire. So uh, it's not necessarily what people are doing. It's how they are doing it. And I think if they really try hard enough, you can get rid of the – for lack of better from scumbags are out there and keep the people with the, with the righteous fight around uh, to do the, the, the Lord's work. Uh, it's funny I say that, uh, you know how I am with religion, but you know what I'm saying. Um, I, I, I always push that uh, the people think everybody down there is part of the swamp. It's not true. Um, like with a lot of things in life, I think the swamp is, is loud, powerful, but the minority. I think there's a lot of people there who want to do good. Uh, we just have to make sure they have the chance to do it. Well, and again, we're looking to the wrong savior if we're <laughs> expecting a president to make that type of change. If we look at one of the biggest problems with our American political system, and it is money in politics, campaign finance reform is the only thing that's really going to make a change and drain the swamp. But when you have a Supreme Court that you know votes to uh, keep uh, campaign financing the way that it is and, and Citizens United decision and so on and so forth, uh, where big corporations count as individuals and can donate till the cows come home and, and lobbyists working for those organizations that are making big dollars and are influencing our government, you know, that's the problem. And the president himself cannot stop that. So, you know, we need to be looking at where the problem can actually be solved. And it's not by electing one person. That's that's the truth. And look at Bannon through this interview. And it was Charlie Rose, I thought was actually kind of hard on him um but you know Bannon's not going to hear anything he doesn't want to hear I mean, he, this is old hat to him i'm sure he's giving interviews like this uh for a while now but you know, this is the guy who said that russia is not a scandal it's it's complete farce he thinks the bush administration they're all a bunch of morons the same with the obama and clinton administration and even further back he thought the whole uh grab them by the p was you know where we got our name from that whole controversy was no big deal uh when everybody else was kind of worried about it he's like ah people just don't locker care room talk. Locker. yeah just just he repeated because it it's just locker room talk he's gonna say that over and over again so this is the guy who is in one of the most powerful positions one of the most influential positions in not only the country, but probably the world, and this is his attitude towards things. Uh, it's no, it's no uh, surprise that the president was going a certain way for quite a while and and was pushing certain beliefs. You know, as I watched the interview, I I found myself getting increasingly upset and disturbed with Bannon's take on, on all of these things and. And certainly his, his brush off of so many of these major issues. And it seemed to me just another case of political diversion. You know, let's throw a smoke screen that, you know, so that nobody pays attention to what's really going on and what the real root of the problem is. Yeah, I guess he, he did learn something in Washington, D.C., how to uh, say, hey, look over there like a magician and, and hide uh, what they're really doing or the, or the worst parts of things. Really, all you need to know about Bannon is this. He thinks President Trump acts presidential. He thinks his tweets are presidential because they go out to the people. Uh, anybody – I don't mean to make anybody who disagrees with me feel bad, but anybody who thinks Trump acts presidential – is ridiculous. And there'll be the people out there who are saying, well, he's president, so by the very nature of his actions, they are presidential. No, we're talking about uh, what people think of when they think of presidential. Uh, president Trump does not does not act that way. It just, just does not. 
It's the way that he carries himself. It's without it lacks dignity, it lacks grace, it lacks tact. All of those things are pretty major characteristics that any political leader should have. I, to, to end on a quote from Bannon when it comes to Trump tweeting, you're going to get some good and every now and then you're going to get some less good. I can't believe more. <laughs> failing to take responsibility for anything. Yeah. And, and also, Steve, most people would say bad, not less good. And I know what you're trying to do there by not saying bad, but less good, please. Speaking of less good, uh, Trump's number one agenda item these days is is tax reform. It's been months since uh, we really talked about this. The administration announced their plan, which was basically a bunch of bullet points double spaced on one piece of paper. Um, Republicans in Congress um, have been driving the process with little input from Democrats. Maybe that'll change now uh, the way things are going with the Trump uh, White House. But again, uh, one action is not enough to make me feel good about this. No, and I don't think anybody felt too confident about the president's proposal for tax reform since it came out in a one-page bullet-pointed <laughs> memo. Yeah, and, and those bullets itself didn't look so great. Uh, on, on Friday, our good friend, also Sarah Huckabee Sanders, said the president is committed to moving legislation through. He wants Congress to act. He's happy to have Democrats be a part of it. They say that all the time. And then when they don't talk to the Democrats, they yell at them as offering no, no you know, no helpful ideas and, and being part of the problem. Um, but the debt ceiling is out of the way for the moment. Uh, tax reform is right there on the table to be taken. Um, the tax code is complicated. I mean, I've looked at uh, bills dealing with the tax code before. I have no idea what the hell I'm, I'm looking at, and this is stuff I've dealt with though for over a decade. Um, but from what I saw, Trump's plan didn't seem to be the answer. No, it, it seems to be skewed towards the wealthy once again as – a shocker, you know, we should corporations. Be <laughs> Absolutely not. But again, you know, this is where I, I feel they're thinking that they can pull the wool over people's eyes, that the tax code is complicated and that they're going to skew this in favor of their well-to-do friends. Needs to be something done for the middle class. Uh, the middle class, I think, feels kind of left behind. We see uh, a lot of things like the stimulus package and uh, things to do with healthcare that deal with the lower class. Obviously, the uh, upper class is always getting their tax cuts. I think the middle class feels like they need something. And anything that gets done for the Democrats to want to support it, uh, they have to get rid of all the tax cuts for wealthy people. Just get them out of there. Um, it has to be fiscally responsible. Uh, and it has to move through what they call regular order, meaning you know the way things are supposed to move through in Congress, the way bills are supposed to be passed in Congress. Uh, that's not been happening as often as we had hoped, in, again, in this administration and in this Congress. Much is often made, Jess, about fiscal responsibility, and it's typically something that the Republicans talk about. But it's also fiscally irresponsible for a Republican-sponsored budget or Republican-sponsored tax reform bill that gives tax breaks to the people who can, you know, most readily do without a tax break. Yeah. Um, when, when you have that much money... Uh, you're going to do okay, uh, even if they tax you just a teeny bit more. Now, the GOP plan will probably have things in it like a lower tax rate for the wealthiest individuals. What we just said the Democrats will not <laughs> work with. Um, they want to repeal the estate tax, which, again, I think you have to have at least $5.5 million or so for that to even affect you. So most people would not be affected by that. Again, only wealthy individuals. Um, they want to eliminate the state and local tax deduction, which is not going to make people like you or me happy. It <laughs> applies directly to the middle class of which we speak. Yeah. Um, and the Republicans themselves are just divided on how deeply these uh, cuts should be to corporate tax rates. Uh, Trump wants to cut it down from 35 to 15%. I think Ryan wants to be in the mid-20s. Um, in, in the end, it doesn't matter because I'm not interested in cutting the corporate tax rates. Again, I'm interested in helping the middle class, uh, something I think we have to keep driving home week after week uh, as this process continues. However, the president is not familiar with the middle class because he's never been a member of it. No, no, no. You know, he's he's basically the Marie Antoinette let them eat cake type of class. <laughs> As we get towards the end of this podcast, uh, some people in the Trump inner circle are not having good weeks. Uh, we're going to start with Donald Trump Jr., Donnie Jr. Uh, last week, he testified at a closed-door session with the Senate Judiciary Committee investigators. By the way, I used to work right across the hall from uh, the Senate Judiciary. Uh, their staffers 
doing exactly what I did, got paid $10,000 more. It was always a sore subject with me, but that's neither hide nor here. Uh, the session had to do with the now famous Trump Tower meeting with the Russians, Jared Kushner, Paul Manafort. Uh, this also follows Bob Mueller's uh, announcement that his team's going to be interviewing staffers who were on Air Force One the day that President Trump dictated uh, to Don Jr. Uh, his statement about the Russian meeting, which, you know, that's not cool. The meeting was also supposed to be, by the way, about having info on adoption, which, of course, was not what it was about. No, not at all, as we've seen. And again, this all stinks to the high heaven. Um, so hopefully this investigation is turning up some meaningful information that would lead towards uh, possible impeachment. Yeah, you just uh, something tells me that. Trump won't go down, but everybody else around him will, including uh, his kids. The, the thing that made me laugh more than anything when reading um, some of the stuff that came out of this closed door session is that uh, apparently Don was trying to say that uh, he was looking into this incriminating information on Clinton because he wanted to make sure that she was competent enough and had fitness for office. Yeah, he was he was doing the again doing the Lord's work, making sure that that she was good for president. No, they were trying to find anything they could get at her uh, to dis to defeat her. Who are you kidding, Don? Who are you kidding? Well, perhaps he was just concerned about her health and her well being. Hey, you know that's that's a sweet boy. Uh, you know that's what Trump calls him. He always he's a good boy. Dude's They're like good 38. Boys. They're all good He's boys and good yeah. girls, you know, yeah. that they do no harm. Yeah, you know, he's just a little boy, little girl, not a man. No, not at all. Uh, the other person in the Trump inner circle to have kind of a bad weekend was uh, Dan Scavino Jr. Uh, he's the White House social media director, and he tweeted out a video that he initially claimed was a video of a flooded Miami International Airport during the hurricane. Um, guess what? It was fake news, fake Kevin. News. Fake news. Uh, people online had to point out that it was not the uh, Miami airport, which I have been in. Very nice airport. Bienvenido. Uh, it was actually Mexico City's airport from another another storm, you know, whenever. Um Miami Airport actually had to go on Twitter and clarify, like, yeah, no, we're good. There's no water covering our floors right now. Um, Scavino's main job, we all know this, is basically to alternate between Twitter sycophant and Twitter troll. Um, he spends most of his days going after places like CNN and New York Times, calling them fake news. and going. His main job is to tweet things out for the president. You got to make sure they're correct, buddy. You would think, especially when you're going to be so critical of what you call the, the fake news media his <laughs> i loved his excuse well i'm getting lots of tweets at me and stuff so i can't you know verify all of them well yeah maybe you should verify the ones you're going to retweet or you're going to tweet out i don't know someone tweeted out a picture of gilligan's island and was like oh my god tour group stranded because of irma somebody save them i thought it was pretty funny you know i always liked the professor i he was he was my favorite i think well, I loved when he, when they came back in a movie where they all came back and the professor's like trying to invent the Frisbee, which has already been invented, or the hula hoop things that have already been invented. And, uh, you know, I was always more of a Marianne guy than a Ginger, but uh, Ginger couldn't make it in, in Hollywood, which came back because, you know, they wanted her to do nudity and that wasn't the kind of girl she was. Anyways. By the way, at the end of that movie, they ended up back on the island again. Uh, in subsequent movies, they got off it one more time after finding an airplane that they had previously not seen and turned it into a resort. There's your Gilgan's Island uh, knowledge for the day. You know, one would think you'd never get back <laughs> on a boat. Yeah, um, yeah. Or one would think maybe if the Harlem Globetrotters showed up at your uh, island, maybe they'd tell somebody you were there and they'd come save you. But you know, that's, that's just ridiculous. So what do you got for Kevin's Corner this week? Well, Jesse... Today, as we noted, is one of the most infamous dates in American history. Reliving the events of September 11th, 2001 makes us think of all that is wrong with the world. In teaching young people who were born after that fateful day, I am aware that generations of Americans will inherit a nation that has known no peace in their lifetimes, has lived on a constant alert of terror, and that has been forced to sacrifice civil liberties in exchange for a bit of safety and security. I am also reminded by these young people, however, that there is hope, a way to move forward and seek a greater peace. Given the terror of 9-11 and Charlottesville, we face great division and turmoil in this country. The way beyond this is in defeating ignorance. By seeking to find common ground and common experiences, we may break down the barriers 
that often cause such a deep divide. White, black, Christian, Muslim, gay or straight, we have more in common than we do different. If we strive to find the common ground, we may defeat any hate that attempts to pull us apart. Let us continue to not give in to powers that seek to divide us for their own personal or political gain, be they terrorists or elected officials. Well said, Kevin. Well said. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us on this uh, 9-11 episode. It's, uh, we like to have fun here, but it's always uh, important to remember the important things in life. Uh, you can also go to our webpage at www.grabthembythepod.com. Find all of our social media info. Find out how to 